Bertrand Henschel was born in Opel, Germany, and came to the United States and Rensselaer and St. Joseph's College with her husband Alfred Henschel in 1952. This is her story. My story really starts with the start of the war in September 1939. Before that, it was like a normal life, like everybody led it at this time. I was single at this time, but I was engaged to Alfred. There was no idea, we didn't have any idea that we would be married six weeks later because Alfred was a career soldier and he could not marry, that was the law, before he was, until he was 25 years old. So here it was September the 1st. We woke up one morning and we were told the war is on. We didn't know what to do because there were lots of rumors for a long time, but actually nobody, we, we didn't believe there really will be a war. We thought the territories will be given back to us and that will be the end of it. And then we heard that uh, the war, Germany marched into Poland. Alfred was stationed at this time in Gleiwitz, which is very close to the former Polish border. There are three cities, Gleiwitz, Hindenburg, and Beuthen. Alfred was stationed there, and I was supposed to go to him for his birthday, which was the 1st of September. Well, I went anyway. And on the train, the people already said, where are you going? And I said, my fiancé is in Leibniz. And they said, don't you know a war broke out? But it really didn't mean much to me. I wanted to see Alfred. So when I got to the place, what he gave me, it, he was in a private home at this time. He was gone, of course. So I turned around and went home. Uh, there wasn't, we were rationed right away. It was overnight. Overnight we had to have black curtains uh, so no light could go out in the evening. Overnight, it was well prepared ahead of time because overnight every block had a block leader, you know, to tell us what to do if there is an alarm or anything like this. And, but, we got ration right, right away also. We had generous rations, and we really didn't suffer. Uh, what was hard to get, we could always barter for. And it seems at this time, everybody had connection to the country, like my parents. My mother comes from the country, so there was always, like uh, when I got my first apartment, the furniture, my mother just took butter and eggs and stuff like this from chickens mm -hmm. from the farm and paid on top of the rations what we got. It was so funny because after Alfred came home, we got married and Alfred came home and we got, um, what do you call it? It's not a ration, a slip to buy stuff. So we wanted to buy the beds, of course. And um, Alfred got the mattress. I got straw. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother with her butter and chickens, she managed to get me the mattress too. And well, um, Alfred wrote to me that he wants to get married on the 18th of November, the same year, because uh, the regulations were lifted. And he said, why wait? And I thought, why wait, indeed. One day I worked in an office for a man who was in charge of antique art,
parks and churches and old buildings from the province of Upper Silesia. So one day he came, a soldier came to the office and he said, Alfred doesn't want to get married on the 18th of November, but on the 14th of November already. So my mother was upset, but we all managed and Alfred came home. He was home three weeks, then he had to leave for Poland again. And here I was married, living at my mother's house. And in spring, Alfred came back and he was stationed in the Czechoslovakia. And uh, he had written to me if I would come, he has a room for me and I could stay for a while. And what year is this? Country? That was in spring 40, okay. 1940. So, I got on the train, foreign country, foreign language, but here was my husband. So I went on the train, the people told me, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Pilsen, which was close to the Bavarian border. I had to travel through the whole Czechoslovakia, over Prague and then to Pilsen. And they said, don't you know the war broke out in the West? there are no soldiers left in the Czechoslovakia anymore. And I thought, what am I going to do? When I get to Pilsen, I said, well, you can, all you can do, get off the train and take the next train back. So I came to the railroad station in Pilsen and here was Alfred on the motorcycle. <laughs> and I said, they told me you are all gone. And he said, yes, we would have gone. He, he was with an outfit which had horses, and the horses got sick. So they stayed behind, and they never made it to the west, you know? So I stayed with them about three weeks, then went home, worked in the meantime, you know, at the office, and then the next time I knew, we still really didn't have to suffer because we had enough food, we had rations to buy clothes and everything like this, but it really wasn't too bad. It, it was only bad because you, it, it's the family members, you know, from the neighborhood, the boys we grew up with had to go into the war. I was, our family was lucky because my father was too old to go. My older, oldest brother I had, Two, uh, Dietmar was only six years old, no, three years old. And uh, my older brother, George, he was too young to be drafted. So we were safe. The only worry we had was about Alfred. At that time he was safe too. Uh, and then he wrote, everybody who knew something about water had to join the Marine. And he was an engineer in the army. They are the people who build bridges in the rivers. So he had to go to the marine. <coughs> and he was stationed in the northern part of Germany, and near Hanover, in fact. So I went there and I stayed with him for three weeks. And that's the first time I went through uh, alarms. We didn't have any airplanes going over Silesia, but then in the northern part, and it was the English army bombing there. Uh, after I went home again, and then Alfred was sent to Belgium, and he was in the outfit called Operation Sea Lion. They were supposed to land in England. Well, this didn't happen. And in 41, he was sent to Lorraine, Elsass Lorraine, which was at one time German, one time French, in mm -hmm. back and forth. So he had, in 41, 
I joined him in August of 41. I joined him in Lorraine. We had an apartment. And I must say that was probably the happiest time in my married life, the few months we lived there. And I wanted a baby so badly. And there was a cathedral in Metz. And <coughs> right when you came in, there was a black Madonna from Chester Hall. And so each day I would go to the black Madonna and pray to get pregnant. And in November, yeah, um, I had a little, not really a party, but the secretary from Alfred, was, who was a soldier, I invited him to eat with us. And the next day I was very sick. And he was sick too. And it went on for three days and Alfred, I always I told Alfred, I said, Alfred, ask him if he's still sick. And the third day he said, you better, you better be prepared for something because I'm not sick anymore. I thought it was my potato salad. <laughs> well, I was pregnant. So I went home at this time to get my winter things and then I, I went over Berlin and there I spent uh, the night in the bunker because we were bombed. But I made it home and packed my things and went back to Alfred. In January, Alfred was supposed to come home with me because um, I knew then for sure I will have a baby. And uh, the day before we were supposed to leave, his full of was canceled. He couldn't make it. So I went home alone. And what can I tell you? I was just there, I was in my mother's house waiting for Ingo to be born. And early in June, Alfred got another leave and he came home, but a week before Wolfram was born, he was called back again. And then I had Wolfram. I had him at home. And the mid with the midwife, the midwife, Fräulein Malik, she delivered my little brother already, you know, so it was nice. And Alfred came home suddenly in August. Ingo was six weeks old. He came home because he took a, a transport to the southern part of Russia. In the meantime, the war with Russia had broken out. So uh, he was home just for th three days so he could see his son. The next during this time then, we also were bumped in Silesia. Um, it was always, we had two alarms a day, one at 11 o'clock in the morning and it was the Russian airplanes. They never did anything. They never dropped a bomb, nothing. It got so that we didn't even want to go to the basement because we knew there was nothing. In the evenings, the Americans came, and you better be in the basement, because we were bombed. One part of my city, but it was the southern part. We lived in the northern part. We never were bombed, except we spent the nights in the basement. Uh, this southern part was bombed very badly. And it was Christmas in... No. Uh, Alfred came home one and a half year later for Christmas. He was already in Russia. That would have been what year? Thing. What year was that? It, it was in. Uh, wait a minute. Ingo Wolfram was born 44, 40, in 43. 
Christmas 43, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, we spent, he stayed with me, I had a little apartment by then. And he stayed with me over Christmas, but we were bumped on Christmas night. So we had to spend the night in the basement. And it wasn't much of a Christmas. But here was little Ingo, he was one and a half year old. Alfred saw him after one and a half year first time. Little Ingo was scared to death of him. You know, he shied away. Mm -hmm. He was a man in uniform, giving him orders. And um, it still was a good time just to be together. And when we took Alfred to the railroad station to catch a train back to Russia, my mother said, Alfred, wouldn't it be nice if you would just have a, a tiny little shot so they can send you home? You know, and he said, no, 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 no. I, I rather want to come home healthy, you know, when everything is over. Yeah. And you know, two weeks later, in January, yeah, the end of January, I got a letter from a doctor from Russia that Alfred was wounded and they cannot transport him. And we didn't know what it was. And Was this from a German doctor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was in a hospital in Russia then. But they call Lazarette. Yeah, but a German, a German hospital. Doctor. He wasn't a prisoner at this point. Yeah. No, he was No. Okay. Well, uh, we guessed, of course, you know. And my little sister Rosemary, one morning she, she woke up and she said, I know, I dreamt that he was shot in his back. Mm -hmm. Two days, uh, yeah, about two days later we get a letter uh, dictated by Alfred to the nurse. And he said, uh, the nurse told us, that he was shot in his stomach. Mm -hmm. That's why they cannot transport him. And Alfred said he is dreaming only about my mother's canned foods. You know, because he couldn't eat, he couldn't drink, nothing. And my mother stopped everything and said, from now on, nobody gets canned foods. We have to save it for Alfred. And we, I told my sister, see, you were mistaken. She was not. Then it turned out he had a, he was shot. When he got back, he went to his troops to see how they were doing. And a soldier, a Russian soldier, shot him in the back, in the hip. Mm -hmm. And the shot went through and got stuck in his wallet. Wolfram has it. And hit German penny and bent the German penny. Wolfram has it on, mm -hmm. and it ricocheted from the penny. Instead of going out, it ricocheted into his stomach and damaged his kidney and his intestines. And that's why he couldn't be transported. And after a few days, then we got word that he was. They were. At that same time, the German soldiers were retreating from Russia, and they had to take all the wounded people back. They took him first to the northern part of Germany, and he finally landed in Bavaria in an army hospital. And he wrote to me if I would come there. So I picked up his mother because I knew she was worried, and I wanted her to go with me so she can be with her son. And we came to the hospital and when I said, I'm Mrs. Sensch, and the nurse said, oh, she said, the doctor wants to see you, he's waiting for you. I was so scared. He had my little boy at home with my mother and they told me, you know, uh, the doctor has to see me before I can see Alfred. And I said, what happened? And she said, I can't tell you, you know. And I said, oh my God. So the doctor came and he said, he was healing too fast. They had to open him up again so everything could be drained again, you know. So uh, 
I spent two weeks with him then. And I got home, and a week later, I got a letter that Alfred insisted he wants to be in the hospital at home in Auckland because he said, I, the doctor told him it would take two years before he was, would be healed. It took him six months, you know, because he felt if he is at home with us, it will be better. So he refused a nurse to bring him back. He said, I should do it. So I went again to Bavaria and got it. And the train was bombed, you know, and everything, it was war. So everything like this, but it, uh, that's when we got this apartment then. Alfred w recovered What so happened when the train was bombed? I mean, the, did you stop the train and get the off? The train stopped and we just sit there and started praying and thought, well, you know, what can you do? Alfred couldn't even walk, you know, I had to lean him on the wall wherever, you know, and help him up and he was almost completely helpless. But he still insisted he wanted to go mm -hmm. home, you know. And uh, the army hospital was, oddly enough, my school, where I went to school. It was the Academy of the Notre Dame Sisters. And the sisters were nurses then who taught us school. Yeah, and here I brought my husband to them after all these years. Alfred recovered so much that he was sent to a town in, called Brieg, about 40 miles from us. And uh, it, it was very hard to get an apartment, and I got an apartment. It, it was army housing. And I, I wrote a letter and I said, here we want to have a second baby but it's, uh, we can't have it because we are living with my parents, you know. You know, I got pregnant right there. So here I was pregnant. Happy because we never dreamt what's going to happen to us. That was in June, you know. And uh, I was happy in my little apartment. It was so nice. I didn't even want Alfred around anymore because I, I, I had all I wanted, a nice apartment and little Ingo. And I said, that's all I want in life, you know, nothing else. And Christmas, Alfred, Christmas 44, Alfred came from Brie, 40 miles winter time, on a bicycle, just to be Christmas with me. And we spent it in the basement because we were, we were bound very badly. And then he went back. And then the rumors were flying. Uh, we knew we lost, uh, Germany lost the Russian front. They came all back. But we, we never thought war would actually ever be in Germany, on German territory. And it was my mother's birthday on the 15th of January. Uh, we were talking about <coughs> it and I had a friend I went to school with and she lived in the same complex where I lived and her husband was a high officer in, uh, in, the, in the headquarters from the army. And so I asked her, her name was Edithard Schneider, and I said, Edithard, what does your husband say? And he, she said, he said, it's bad. So on the 19th of January, four days later, four o'clock in the morning, somebody knocks on my door. And I went up, got up and went to the door. He was another friend of mine. And she said, we have to get out right away. My husband just left work. We all, and he was an officer. We have to get out. Uh, then you are so paralyzed, you don't know what to do. You say, Where, what am I doing? And I said, well, first thing, I pack up Ingo and I go to my mother. So I put him in his buggy and drove, uh, went up to my mother. 
and told my mother didn't know anything. And I said, we have to get out. She said, no, I'm not going. You know. And then I went to a friend and she said, she was packing already, and she said, I'm going to my mother-in-law in Nice. And I said, well, if I have to get out, I'm going to Nice too. That's where my, my mother-in-law lives. And uh, so I went back to my apartment and I thought um, I will start packing. First of all, I said I have to cook a good meal. So I made potato dumplings and canned strawberries, potato dumplings with bacon. I said that will be a good idea. To think of something like this is so, when you think back, it's so idiotic, you know. Then I baked cookies because I thought we are going on a trip and little Ingo needs cookies to go on a trip, you know. So in the meantime, a soldier came and Alfred had sent him and he had to, told me, he said, your husband said to go and go to his mother. And I had packed stuff and I sat on the stuff and I started crying and I said, I can't go, I can't leave. What's going to happen? I'm pregnant. I'm nine months pregnant. My baby is due on the 22nd of February and she is the 19th of January. I said, I can't go. So he left. I went back to my mother. And when I came to my mother and she said, I met Fräulein Malik the midwife and she said where is she and my mother said she refuses to leave and Fräulein Mali said tell her to go and my mother told her said you know she claims she cannot have a baby without you and she told my mother tell her to go and we will have the third one together well I never saw Fräulein Malik again and I never had a first baby. So then I said, okay, my mother said, you better go. They told us we have to cross the river Ode and then we will be safe. So my mother said, leave everything here. I left the feather beds on my bed. <coughs> and I got on the train, one of the last trains going out and I got on the train on a Saturday and I went to my mother-in-law with little Ingo. And my mother said she would bring as much as she could. Well, three days later she came, couldn't bring a thing anymore because they really, the last train out. And here we were. The only thing she had brought along, we, my mother had one turkey. She butchered that one turkey and brought this turkey along and she decided we will cook it at my mother-in-law place. <coughs> she cooked it, nobody ate, nobody. We just couldn't, you know. My father, my father was at this time in a hospital in Breslau, which was about 60 miles west of us. He was operated of cataract and he was completely blind because he had only one eye. He had a glass eye in his left eye because he had a head wound from the First World War. It was shut out. So it was in the hospital. The whole time we were in Nice, there was about four days. My mother sat at the railroad station trying to get a train to go to him. Impossible. And then they bumped nice. Well, I must say, my mother had my sister Rosemary, my sister Hildegard, and my brother Dietmar with her. And we stayed all at my mother-in-law. Then we were bumped in nice. And we spent the night in my in, in the building with this. And sometimes I think the, f 
fear of this basement saved my life. I was so petrified. It was a, you know, partitioned off in the basement where people stored from the apartment, they stored coals and potatoes, canned goods, mm -hmm. but it was just like black dirt. It was dark, it was so awful. And I said, I can't have my baby there. That's impossible. You know, Ingo was scared. And so I went around this after two days looking for a doctor. The doctors were gone. Then I said, thought I will go and check with the hospital. And here were German soldiers on the street and they always said, you are still here? You are still here? Because I was that big, mm -hmm. you know. And I said, I, I need a hospital. I'm going to have the baby. So I got to the hospital and the nurses said, well, the hospital is here. The doctors are gone. They left already, you know. So I went back to my mother-in-law and they said they will go to a village where her other, her son's wife came from and they will stay there. And I decided we are going on the, t on the train. We go to the railroad station. So we caught a train and it was a train full of people who worked uh, on the railroad. And, uh, but we were just sitting there like sardines, you know, so people tried to get on the train, they couldn't. It was complete pandemonium because everybody had said, get up, get up, go west, you know, and nobody knew where to go. So in the, I was on the train for two days and we came to Reichenbach in the mountains and I started bleeding before that already. I said, what am I going to do now? You know? So the train chucked into the railroad station in Reichenbach the train usually take, took only hours. At that time it took days then, you know. And uh, we had enough, oddly enough, uh, we had enough food because uh, everybody was fleeing, Every, any, everything was deserted. Wherever we went, there were uh, women handing out sausages and bread and everything. So we really didn't suffer as far as food was concerned. And then in Reichenbach, I had to get off the train. And my mother, of course, stayed with me. And I was sitting on the on a milestone on the street, trying to think. And my mother said, what are we going to do now? We have to find a doctor. And all of a sudden, we saw lots and lots of people coming, you know, like marching, but civilians accompanied with German soldiers. And this, and it was women, children, and men. And we just sat there and one of the women came to me and she had her hands wrapped up in a cloth. And she said, would you know where there's a doctor? And I said, lady, I'm looking for a doctor too. And she said, my hands are frozen. And I said, where are you coming from? And she said, from Auschwitz. There were thousands walking all the way. And they were half frozen. You know. It, it, it was bad, and so I went with all the rest of the people wherever the, they went and asked people, uh, people from the city said, is there some place, a hospital or something where I could have the baby, I'm bleeding. And they said, yeah, there is a clinic. And they put me in this clinic, but Ingo, my mother, and my two sisters and my brother, they were sent to a kindergarten. They couldn't stay with me in the clinic. 
and I stayed there one night and next morning I heard the nurses talking that they are being evacuated. See, in the meantime, my mother never found out where my father was. She never saw him, you know, and before then. Mm -hmm. And so <coughs> I was so frightened. And I said, is the kindergarten going where you are going to? And they said, we, we don't know where they are going. It's only the clinic, the orders we got, you know. So I got out of bed and I got dressed and I went to the kindergarten and said, I have to be with Ingo. I cannot lose my son. And here they were and they said, we have to get, we have to get up again and go on. And I had stopped bleeding. And we got on a hospital train and I was sitting there in a compartment. It was just benches. It was very long this side and this side benches. And the young doctor came then, you know, and uh, he said, you tell me when you are ready to deliver. Don't you dare, you know, to do something foolish. And I said, okay, I, I will, you know. And then in, uh, toward evening, he came and he said, you know what, I give you my compartment and uh, you can stretch out on my bed and I said no I have my little boy here I'm not leaving him and he said you can take him you can take him so here I was in this beautiful nicely furnished compartment warm clean sheets and everything you know he brought us food Ingo had cookies he used to call him cookie uncle and he gave him cook and he tried to persuade me then. He said, where are you going? And I said, I really don't know. But my first place is, I want to go to Wittenberg because in Wittenberg, Lutherstadt, that's south of Berlin, that's where Alfred's sister lived. And I don't know anything about Alfred. And that's the only way I can get some news because he would, write to her because he, he knew we are gone and if times are normal again and the mail will go again he will write to her and then I thought I leave a note to her after I have the baby and then we can go west you know and so he said uh, he said you know he lost his fiancé in, in the Rhineland they were bumped out and she died in the bombing. And he said, I have a house in Eger. Why don't you, it's part of uh, Czechoslovakia. He said, why don't you come with me and you can have your baby there. You don't even know if your husband is alive. And he said, I always wanted a little guy like your son is and you can stay with me. And, and so I said, no, I have to go to Alfred's sister, you know. So we came to Dresden and was that was the day Dresden was bombed. We were there like at noon. And we were that standing... That would be February 13th, 1994, 1944. 45. 45. Yeah. And see, Wolfram was due on the 22nd of February. And so we got off the train and the doctor said, are you coming with me? The train went on to Eger and I said, no. He was sort of angry and he said, give me the address from your sister and I will write to you. And he said, you, you still have the option, you can come. I said, I can't, I can't. My husband has to know if he is alive where I am. And here we were, we were in the railroad station and my mother said, please, okay, then I thought, well, we can have, probably have a rest here. And there were women standing around and two women, one woman was crying so bitterly, you know, and I stood beside her and the other wo woman was telling her, and I said, don't cry. And she said, look, uh, I lost two children in the ditch too 
they froze to death. We came from the northern part of Germany and uh, he, she said, you lost only one baby and you have more children. You know what? This frightened me so much. And I said, I'm not going to lose my child. I'm going to hold on to Ingo. And I told my mother and they said, we have to go. We have to go. My mother was so angry at me and said, can't you rest? What is driving you? Do you always have to go like a locomotive? You know, and I said, please, please, let's go, let's go. I, I just can't take it, you know. So we were lucky we got on a train out of Dresden and we made it to Leipzig. Which what time did you leave Dresden? In the afternoon, in the afternoon, same afternoon. We were just only a few hours and this woman had frightened me so these women talking that they lost babies on the street. They froze, you know, on the, on the street. That I thought, I have to run, I have to go, you know. We came to Leipzig and the alarm all over. We had to get off the train then and got into the bunker. We all had to go to the bunker. Then I started to have sort of pains, you know, you don't feel well, the ninth, ninth month or something, and sitting, my legs were like, oh, I can't tell you, they were big like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had put on, before I left home, I had put on long underwear from Alfred, because it was winter, you know, and I had to be warm, and I said, I, I saved only two suitcases. I had one suitcase with clothes for Ingo and myself, and then a suitcase with baby things, because I knew I'm going to have the baby, so I needed clothes, and I said, I need to keep warm too. I had a fur coat, a black seal. <coughs> Many years ago it wasn't a crime to have a seal coat then, you know. Mm -hmm. And I saved this, I couldn't wear it because it was the princess style, but I wrapped Ingo in it to keep Ingo warm and safe, you know. And well, anyway, we got out in Leipzig, we were in the bunker, and uh, the doctor came to me. And it, he was a young doctor, and he wanted to examine me. And I was so embarrassed that I, because I wore these long underwear, you know, ugly, big like this, I was so ashamed and I, I said, no, 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 no. And he said, yes, I have to see how far you are gone, you know. And he couldn't get my long underwear off my legs, so they had to cut it off then, you know. I was all right then. We spent the night in the bunker and next day we went to Wittenberg to Alfred's sister. And then uh, we came there on the, I think it was a Wednesday, yeah, and then I started bleeding again. And my mother took me to the hospital. And in the hospital they put me in the hall. And I heard this women screaming around me, you know, and the nurse, any time she came by, and she always, she always said, you are next, you are next. And she had frightened me so much, and I said, that's what you think. I got up after she disappeared again, you know. I got up, get dressed, didn't have any shoes, house shoes, you know. And I walked back to my sister-in-law in the snow in house shoes. I said, I'm not staying here. She frightens me, <laughs> you know. My mother, in the meantime, went to the hospital to see me, and they said, she disappeared. She's not here anymore. Well, to make it short, I had Wolfram a day late on the 23rd of February. And soon afterwards, we had to flee again. Now, the whole time was, it was very bad. We started to have trouble getting food. Uh, it was winter. We were bombed. 
Yet, we spent most of the time in the basement, and we were like, in the one basement, we were 14 persons. And here Wolfram, I nursed him, he was crying, and to keep him still, I would nurse him day and night. You know, night, all night. I just kept him on my breast. Gertrude, I understand that now that you left Dresden, not much more than an hour before, we firebombed Dresden in one of the most terrible uh, bombings of the entire Second World War. And I wondered if you'd go back a little bit and talk about uh, that night and what you thought about Dresden, about being close to the West and how you thought you were safe and so forth. Yeah, uh, I actually don't know much about the bombing. And uh, nobody knew that's going to happen that afternoon when we were there. I know only it was like a focal point of all the refugee tracks coming from the east. Everybody, you know, by train or by horses and buggies, by foot, everybody was coming into Dresden because it, it was like the gate to the west. Everybody thought, you are safe in Dresden. Once you are in Dresden, then you can, like my mother said, why can't you relax? We can rest now. The danger is sort of over, you know? And uh, it was just wherever, it, Dresden was crowded with people. They were just like sardines in the railroad station. And like I said, I, I stood next to the women talking about the dead babies they left on the road. And this is really the point which frightened me so much, you know. And I wondered, if I knew if I had listened to my mother to stay there, we probably wouldn't be alive today. If I had listened to the doctor, we probably would have been in the middle of the bombing, too. Although I know he made it, because I got a letter from him in Wittenberg. And in the letter he wrote uh, how I was doing, and did I change my mind, and I still could come to Eager. And did I have a baby? Did I hear from my husband? And I wrote back to him and told him I had the baby. I had a little boy. I still don't know where my husband is, if he's still alive. But I want to stay in Wittenberg because that's the only way I could get some news about my husband through his sister because um, everything was so messed up. And I thought the only way if Alfred is alive and he's trying to find us will be through his sister. So that's how we got to Leipzig. And we heard in Leipzig then that Dresden was just destroyed. Leipzig is about how far from Dresden? Uh, <coughs> I think it's about 40 miles northwest of Dresden. Dresden is here, Leipzig is here, and Wittenberg is here, up north, south of Berlin. And it's wittenberg that you know where mm -hmm. Martin Luther put his thesis on the church door. Well, uh, so I had Wolfram now. We were bumped every night. I kept him in the basement, nursed him during the night, to keep him quiet. Well, pretty soon I developed an abscess on my breast. And uh, I had to go to an army doctor. He said I, he has to cut it out, but he doesn't have anything to numb it. And so I said, well, I have to have it done. And he said, yes. So he started cutting, and I bit him in his arm. And, but he said, go ahead, bite me. I know it hurts. He said, I took out my own appendix, and I know it's tough. And then he gave me a, a whole bag full of bend 
bandages and everything and to stuff stuff it up and he said um, I'm leaving we are all leaving so there won't be any doctors but you take care of yourself you know? and from then on the problem with my little boy started Wolfram was a healthy little boy he wait he like I said he was even one day late in all this misery he was supposed to be born on the 22nd of February he was born on the 23rd in the morning and as long as I could nurse him it was all right he weighed seven and a half pounds we didn't get any baby food uh, first came the second fleeing again from Wittenberg now we were all prepared we would sit in the basement and we were told the American army is taking over because we are going right up to Berlin so we were waiting for the Americans I had a white diapers on the baby bucket way up this means I surrender. <laughs> you know, we all did something like this. We wanted to surrender to the American army. And w then we thought soon it will be over. And one night, one man came running into the basement and he said, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. We just took whatever we could. I packed my babies in the baby carriage, you know, and off we went. Little Ingo had a chamber pot in his hand and we walked, you know, and we walked. And I don't know, I think they were flamethrowers. Something like fire went across the street all the time, going like this. Whoosh, there was a flame. Are these flamethrowers? I don't know. And the soldiers, the German soldiers said, hurry up, hurry up, we are going to destroy the bridge. We had to cross the river there, across the bridge. And Ingo said, little Ingo said, what are we doing? You know, he was two and a half years, two years, nine months, eight months, nine months old, two months. Where are we going, you know? And I said, Ingo, please pray, please pray. And he looked at me and he said, Muti, I cannot pray, I'm not in my bed. You know? Mm. Kids broke your heart, you know? And then pretty soon there was a whole procession, people just trying to escape from Wittenberg. And then came the American flyers. Before that, before we were fleeing again, I, I, we were in Wittenberg. One day I went uptown to buy some stuff and we were in the street and I was on the way back home. And all of a sudden we had alarm. And the airplanes, the American airplanes came flying over us I thought they would hit the roof of the houses, you know, and they were shooting at us in the street, shooting at us, civilians. And everybody ran into a house, you know, and we were, we lived a little outside from the city. We had to cross fields and so And I was running. All I could hear people were yelling. I really don't know what they were yelling. They were yelling at me to go and get shelter, get into the house, and I was running. It was a little safer when I came to the fields because they sh shut only at the people in the streets, you know, not out in the fields. <coughs> and when I came to our little cabin where we lived and I saw my mother with the two babies, I was so relieved. 
and my mother saw me and she took me and she slept me right and left. And I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, don't you know my children, your children will be safe with me? And I said, I have to save my children. You know, and mm -hmm. she said, don't you know? I will save them, you know? Well, then we were fleeing there, you know, for, and um, Wolfram was still, the baby was still doing all right. Although we didn't have much food anymore, but we, I had to cook like rye flour and fill it up with half water and half milk because he wouldn't, didn't want to be nursed anymore since I had surgery. And uh, so we walked along and during, during this walking, a young woman came with the baby and she was all by herself. Her little boy, boy was about like three or four years old and she had asked us if she can uh, go with us because here was my mother, we were a group, you know. And so we went along and then uh, we, uh, we wanted to go to the River Mulde and from there we wanted to cross to Bitterfield, uh, Bitterfeld, uh, which was American side. We wanted to go over to the American side and then we thought we are safe. So we came to this one village and we didn't have a place to go so we were all sitting in the ditches and waiting and seeing you know, if people can find a place where they can put us overnight. And all in a sudden there came a whole troop. First of all, I heard a funny noise. We all heard a funny noise. You know, it was like people were throwing guns in, onto a heap, one after the other, like this, you know, and I started crying and said, the war is still going on, you know, we were so scared. It, you cannot describe the fear, you know, you have. And then one man besides me, he said, you know, these are, uh, uh, that was when the, um, the whole troop of people came and they were Americans. And um, the first in front had a, um, an accordion. And he, here he was playing the beer bell polka. And we were crying when we heard all this noise. And this man came up to me and he said, he, he spoke a, a broken German and he said, uh, don't cry. And they said, what's that, this noise? And he said, the German soldiers and the American soldiers are all throwing their guns down. They want peace, you know. And, but here the German soldiers went into, uh, uh, into American prisons. And while the Americans came from the German prisons and were free, and this one soldier, as you know, when he, he came and he saw me crying, and he came up to me and he said, don't cry, it will be all right. So these were not the liberating soldiers, these were the American soldiers coming out of the German out prisoner of, the of war German camps. Prisoners of war. And the, German is, the Germans were releasing them. And Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, I don't know if they released them. I spoke to this one American when he saw me crying, he came over and he said, don't cry, it will be all right now. You know, and I said, where are you coming from? Coming from? And he said, you know, I know how you feel because we were prisoner of wars. And he cried, you know. All of a sudden he said, they opened the door and an American officer came in and he said, you are free. And he said, you know, he couldn't talk German so well. He grabbed his throat and he said, you know, something was choking me <laughs> here and it's, the tears were rolling down. And then the soldiers, you know, they stood around us, looking at us, and here I was with my baby in my arm, little Ingo mm -hmm. on the side, and they threw their blankets at, at us. They didn't have anything. They were hungry too. 
you know, because the, the Red Cross had broken down by then. They couldn't get food anymore. And all they had left was their blankets, and they gave the blankets to us. For us, it was a lifesaver later on because we all had coats made out of it. And then later when I was in the West, this khaki color blanket, you know, mm -hmm. I had a coat and I had it dyed in dark brown in the West. And I wore it for years afterwards, you know. And we gave blankets to other people too. And then after the soldiers came and they marched, all of a sudden there was a whole bunch of black people running. They were half dressed. One hand they had little packages of Nescafe, you know, uh, what is it, um, instant coffee. Mm -hmm. And they threw it to us. With the other hand, they went through our things in the ditch. They were looking for bread. They were hungry. For bread. Bread, yeah. And she had their hands were black from syrup, mol molasses. And the farmers ran after them because these these black people were from Africa, okay? And they were prisoners of war too. They were brought over by the English. And they didn't, they were hungry, so they were looking for food. First thing they did, they broke into the farmhouses and they found the pots of molasses from the farmers. So they were eating molasses, the sweet mm -hmm. stuff, you know. And, uh, but they wanted to give, they didn't want to steal for us. They wanted to give us this um, instant coffee, you know. So then they marched off and we found a little shack. And it wasn't, it, it was supposed to be a little cabin, but it was only half finished. There was no windows in it. And uh, um, we got straw and put it on the floor and so we could sleep there, which was really good for us because all around that night, the women were, that wasn't this night yet. Okay, I'm ahead of my time. Uh, so from then on, we stayed there for a whole week and this woman we met and I, we would go through the village each, each day and scrounge up food and the German soldiers came with little wagons they were they had looted the factories and everything and they had uh, like butter and bread and everything and we would just uh, go on the highway and we would uh, tell them that they they have to go in into American prison and they cannot take the food, would they give us some? And they did, you know, and they said, you don't need it there, and they, the, the Americans will take it from you. They were at the River Mulder. They will take it from you anyway, you know. Except one day, uh, three men came with a little wagon, and they were three German officers, young officers, and they were so good looking. And I was so ashamed to beg, you know. And here they were, like from here till here. And I looked at them and I turned around. I, I, I just couldn't do it, you know. So this one came after me and he said, you want some food, don't you? And I said, yes. And he said, why don't you come and get it? And, uh, I, I, you know, they were too good looking. And it just, it was, I, I, I just couldn't do it. But mm -hmm. then they came, you know. And then they, they gave me boxes of cigars and cartons of cigarettes. And I said, I don't need it. I need food. I don't need mm -hmm. cigars and cigarettes. And I don't smoke. And uh, he said, yes, you do, because you can barter with it. When you go to the farmers, they will give you food for it, which was true. So I took it, mm -hmm. and it helped me, you know, because later on we had to go back for food at the farmers. And
And so one day I was on the road again, and here I have to tell you this, in the ditch uh, there were the Americans. It was like the guard or something. The whole troop, whatever there was, I don't know it in English, they were, first of all, the, the very same day, I was on the street again with my friend. And there came an American, that was the first American I met in my life. He was on a bicycle, and he stopped us. And this man had the bluest eyes I ever saw in my life. I have never seen anybody with blue eyes like this ever since. And he got off his bike and he said, where are you going? It's broken German. And I said, we are looking for food. And he said, wait a minute. And he went into a farmer's house and he came out and he had a plate and the plate was this high with pancakes pancakes mm -hmm. and behind him the farmer came screaming he took it from the farmer's table his supper and he gave it to us you know and the farmer was screaming his food you know and he said you know what I tried to help you but I have to be in Bitterfield in an hour and he said and then the odd thing he always said potato well at this time, my maiden name is Potempa. And he said, I understood Potempa, Potempa. And he showed, he, he pointed there. And I always thought, what does he know about Potempa? Does he know us or something, you know? And then he disappeared. Later I learned he meant potatoes, that there were potatoes. And he wanted to show us we can get potatoes over there, uh -huh. you know. So, well, the next day I went again on the highway and uh, uh, there were these soldiers, uh, American army, whatever, in the ditch. And they were frying bratwurst. And we stood there, you know, and mouth watering, we were hungry. And uh, this one, man said, you want some? And I said, yes. And he said, are you going to sleep with me? And I said, no, I'm married. And he said, I'm married too, it doesn't matter. And I said, but I don't do it. And he said, you know what, you are right. And he showed me his, I still cry. He showed me his wedding pictures. He wore, I don't know what he was. It looked beautiful, it looked like the movies. He wore a white uniform, you know. And then I told him, I said, I have two babies and I need food for my babies. And he said, you know what? Each day, as long as you are here, I will put food for you in this bush over there at noon at 12 o'clock you come and pick it up so each day I went and got the food and I was able to feed not just the baby we had food you know and it, he got food from I don't know where but it was American food and that was about almost a week and then it was the 9th of May 50 years so and so I came one morning again, one noon, and here he was. And he said, you know what? The war is over. But we promised the Russian soldiers more land, and they will take over, and we have to retreat. And he said, you know what? It's better for pretty Fräulein to be in the house, hide. Mm -hmm. So we went, that was it. And then the Russians came in. And I, I said, uh, we were in this little uh, shack, cabin, mm -hmm. no wind, it was from plaster, but no windows, uh -huh. you know. And nobody 
suspected that people would be there, but we were. My mother and my two sisters, my brother, my two children, the woman with the child and I. And the woman was screaming around us. They are killing us, they are killing us. And we were just hiding in the store and just praying and praying. Nothing happened. Because nobody knew that somebody is in there. You know, they went after real houses, you know. Mm -hmm. And except this one day, I, I, uh, we still were there. We didn't know the American army took our men. They were free to go over the border. Women and children were not allowed to cross the river. We had to stay. And this was dead. The, I couldn't believe that they wouldn't let us go, especially since they know what what is expecting us, you know? And so one day I went in this to this village and uh, we had sent my sister, the one in England, to get some milk. We had to stand in line and we got every day a ration. And I had to go to the shoemaker to get my shoes back. To and my mother wondered where my sister is. And uh, so I went by a farmhouse and I still don't know what made me go in there except I saw people standing in a bunch in the backyard. And, and I was curious. And I went up there and they just always looked and showed up stairs, you know. And I wasn't, I don't know, I was dumb. You know, I had to go and see what's upstairs, you know. The, the people didn't say a word. And so I, I went and I told them, I said, I'm looking for my sister. If they saw a girl like this, and they didn't say a word, but they just looked upstairs. So I went upstairs, and here was my 16 years old sister, and a huge Russian had her by her hand, and leading her around the room, opening one cabinet after the other. I don't know, my sister doesn't know what he had in mind. We talked about mm -hmm. it last November. And uh, so I grabbed my sister and I said, Moya Chostra, that means my sister, it's Polish. I knew some words in Polish. Moya Chostra. And I grabbed her and we ran downstairs. And this man probably was so flabbergasted <laughs> <laughs> that somebody would come up, you know. <coughs> He didn't have to die a time together his wits or anything, you know. Then we got out. We had. Then the order came. We have. To, we all have to go back to Wittenberg. So we had to go back to Wittenberg, and we came back, and we had found another cabin where we stayed, and um, we still. It, my, at this time, during this time, early in spring then, you know, in, it mm -hmm. was May then, after May, uh, my mother was, first of all, early in June, uh, we heard the sirens blowing. There was alarm all over the city. And you know what, we have, have lived through a war with alarms from 39 to 45. We always knew what to do. Then we, we were paralyzed. Nobody knew what to do. And they said, what's going on? Is there still war? We didn't know what to do. Nobody, there was nobody there to give us order and tell us anything. We just stood there. And then later on in the day, they told us that somebody pressed the wrong button and it, it, it was the alarm button. It was nothing, it was false alarm. Anyway, my mother, my sister, Hildegard, 
and my brother Dietmar became ill, very ill. They had diphtheria. I took them on a little wagon to the hospital. And so they, during this time while they were in the hospital, they told us that the bridges were repaired again and we can go back to Silesia. So a lot of people went back to Silesia and to the east, you know, to East Germany. And we couldn't go because my, my mother and the children were in the hospital. And uh, so we thought, oh my God, here we are. We could go home. There were posters that the bridges are repaired, you can go back. By the time my mother came from the hospital, uh, the people who had gone, come, gone back came back nearly beaten to death. Whatever they had taken back was taken away from them. So it was like another miracle. You know, because my mother was sick, we were safe. You know? Uh -huh. And <clears throat> then uh, my mother had, I don't know if she con uh, contracted something in the hospital, and we called it the black rose. Her face fell up. It was like filled with water, and it looked, the colors were blue and red. <laughs> I don't know <coughs> what it really was. And she couldn't talk. She didn't have diphtheria anymore, you know. So she wrote a note, and she she wants to see the priest. And the priest name was the priest was the one who baptized little Wolfram. His name was Father Gaynau. And I went to get the priest. And see, at this time, the priest couldn't be recognized by the Russians as priest anymore. And he had the uh, holy bread in his pocket then, you know, and he came. And I was sitting in the kitchen and I was cleaning vegetables. And he was with my mother and then he came out and he said, do you have anything to eat? And I said, Father, only what we have, what I'm stealing from the fields. And that's another story. We, we just lived in the fields, stealing everything. And uh, he said, uh, okay, I will do something. And an hour later after he left, a man came with a tray full of meat. Hmm. Father again now, right across from us was a Russian kitchen. Father Gino went to the Russian kitchen and it was run by a German who was at the same time the mayor. But uh, what he really was, he was a laborer, except he was a member of the Communist Party. And he was, uh, because he was a member of the Communist Party, he was made a mayor of the city, a big city. He also had the kitchen, the Russian kitchen, for the offices. And so I said, what's that? And he said, the priest was here and told us, you are hungry, you need some meat. And I said, I, I, I never accept anything for nothing. I was always proud. I go and steal, you know, but I, I, I don't, I'm not a beggar. And um, so I said, well, what can we do? And I said, can I work for it? And he said, yeah, you can, in the kitchen, peeling potatoes and onions and cleaning vegetables. And he said, but don't bring your little boy with you, Ingo, when the commander is there, because he hates all blonde people. And my little Ingo was white blonde, you know. So when he was in the vicinity, I never took him along. But then I worked there in, in the kitchen, peeling potatoes and peeling onions for a pot of soup mm -hmm. every day. And uh, before, 
whatever we had, we stole in the fields. We would go in the evenings then early. We had to get uh, be back by 11 because 11 was the curfew. System should stay the way it is. We like it that way, and as far as I know, everybody else in the neighborhood likes it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would agree with anything else. Well, the feelings we just heard were pretty much universal among users of the facilities and the electricity throughout the area. But what about the people who provide the electricity? We turn to Jim Baker with the Rural Electric Cooperative. Well, I think the congressmen that vote for this are going to answer for it uh, uh, in, uh, in the, both the press and possibly the polls uh, under it, because I, I really believe people are going to get very upset once they know about this. I just hope that they get upset before this deal is done rather than after it's done uh, under it. And that's, of course, kind of one of the reasons we like to try to get the story out to the people. If, if the people want to sell something like this for the highest dollar, then uh, it's owned by the people, and uh, I suppose they can do that. But I just can't believe that uh, the people as a whole would want to sell something uh, like uh, Percy Priest or Old Hickory or other dams, uh, reservoirs, and such as that. I just can't believe they want to sell that. Since we started producing this story, there has been a later development on Capitol Hill. The Republican leadership on the House side has withdrawn the sales idea from the Budget Reconciliation Act and now instead are proposing a study of a possible sale. More on the subject on Samuelson Says. We'll be back with more on U.S. Farm Report after these messages. In a perfect world, Every car runs on ethanol. They let me out here. So they let me out. In the meantime, it was past 11 o'clock. And so I was walking. Pretty soon, two officers came, stopped me. And where am I going? They said, going home, going home. You know, it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 I have to go with them. And I said, uh, then I thought, oh my God, here I go again. There were two. And I didn't, so I walked along with them and they showed me the clock and they said, do you know what time it is? And I said, yeah, but uh, you come, I'd wanted to chase me around, you know, and I was delayed, you know, still had my five pound potatoes. <laughs> even with the officers and the car, you know. And uh, so then I heard footsteps, and I looked around, and there were, a, it was a short officer, but he had stars too. And so I turned around to him, and I, I asked him, and I said, are these guards? Is that police, military police? And he said, he talked to them, in, in Russian, you know, what they were doing. And all I can say, he told them, Svinos, that they are swines. <laughs> That's, I understood. <laughs> then he said, where do you live? And I said, up there. You know, I didn't want to tell him where I live. And uh, he said, I walk you home. And I said, oh my God, another one. <laughs> that was a night, you wouldn't believe it. And. So he walked and he said, my comrades bad, huh? And I said, yes, they are very bad. You know what they were going to do? And I said, I can guess, you know. And I said, but you are not bad. You are not bad. That was the wrong thing today, do. Then he felt good. Then he decided he has to go home with me. And I, I, I said, no, 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 no. I can go alone now. It's okay. You know, he said, no, 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 I have to see where you live. And I said, no, you can't, you can't. It's late, you have to go home now, you know. And I'm glad you took me so far. And no hints as if he goes home with me. So then I decided, okay, I never tell him where I live, but I took him to Mrs. Breckler's home, your next mm -hmm. door, you know. And so I told him, I said, you can come in, but here's where I live. And I said, you know what? You have to do it the German way. You know, first we get to know each other, and so you can visit me tomorrow, and that will be nice. And he said, okay, okay. 
So next morning he will come at 11. So I went into the next house where my mother was and my mother was in bed crying. It was like one o'clock or two o'clock. She wondered what happened. Breckler had a son who was like 19 years old and he was always so protective of me. You know, he, he always said, uh, pretty woman, if you have a sister who is like you, I will marry her. You know what? He married my sister Helga. Mm -hmm. And he was shot by the Russian three ma months after they were married. He was caught stealing them in the flower and stuff like mm -hmm. that, shot in the back. And my sister has a baby from him, her oldest daughter. But that was odd. And he was so angry when his mother came home and he said, where is she? And his mother said, one is enough. <laughs> And he was so angry at her, you know. So my mother was glad, and I told her the whole story. And I said, you know, he will come next morning. And she said, you go uptown early. So so I went. And I came back in the afternoon. And uh, when I came back, and she was Mrs. Brightlester screaming at me. And she said, what did you do? This guy came back. And he wouldn't believe that you don't live here. He went from the basement to the attic looking for you. And I thought, well, I paid her back. You know, she left me there too. You know, mm -hmm. so that was okay then. <laughs> you know, but well, in the meantime, I I was working for the Russians. But then uh, things were a little better. That means we got rations. Most of all, we got baby food, and uh, so I, I was so happy that I could give my Wolfram regular baby food, food. But he became, after the first battles, he became so ill. He didn't have any indigestion whatsoever. When I fed him the white stuff in the bottle, the formula, it came out white right away. There was nothing. His stomach didn't function, his intestines didn't function, and he was losing weight in my arms, you know. And so I took him to, and he was then saying, he must have some, suffered something terrible, you know. And I took him to the doctor and she said, uh, you have to bring him to the hospital. There's no way. And I said, no. I I have seen, when my mother was in the hospital, the babies, there were thousands of babies dying. And each day I was there, they had these flat wagons full of little coffins. And I said, not my baby. Nobody knows my baby. I didn't know where Alfred was. I didn't know where my father was, the rest of my sister and father. Nobody will know the baby. I can't do it, you know, I, I have to keep him. And I, I, she said, the Russian will catch you. And I said, you know, when the Russians will see me with a baby carriage and with a sick baby, they won't do anything to me. I don't believe it, you know. So then there was a nurse who had taken care of my mother. And she told me, she said, you know what, you've got to give, let him be here in the hospital. And I swear to you, I will feed him. Because they didn't even bother to feed. They, they, were, they didn't have time to feed, you know? And so I said, okay, that was the last resort. And here were, they didn't have baby beds, they had like a regular patient bed and the bed was like this but the babies were lined up on each bed like this you know and here was my baby and uh, uh, he was four months old and he weighed 16 pounds when i took him to the hospital before uh, when he started to be sick he weighed 16 pounds birth weight seven and a half pounds I took him to the hospital and he got skinnier and skinnier. He looked like a skin rabbit. They had given him shots in his head. And when I saw him 
the blood was dried here along his mm -hmm. side, you know. And so this one day when I was with him and he was lying on his side and I turned him around and he looked at me and he smiled. Like he, like he recognized me. And I screamed and I screamed. And the doctor came and she said, you cannot see your baby again. You know? And, but I went, I took turns with my mother. Every one day I went to the hospital, I couldn't see him. Only through the door, through the little window. And my mother could see him. Next day my mother went. And there was a time when I, it was, August by then, and uh, then um, Wolfram just didn't do very well, and I talked to the doctor, and I said, uh, he said, she said, it, it's hopeless, and I said, doctor, I want to donate blood, and she said, no, you can't. You have another baby. You don't know if your husband is alive. We won't accept it. You know, you, you have to be there for your child. And so then all of a sudden he took a turn to the better. And uh, they said, I can pick him up. My mother came and she said, you can pick him up next day. So next day I went to pick up Wolfram and she was a nurse. And she said, the doctor is waiting for you. She wants you to give blood. He was worse again, you know. Give blood for Wolfram? For Wolfram. Okay. Yeah. They didn't have any way to check blood if it coagulates or not. If it coagulates, they can take it. It did coagulate. I saw it on this little guy. But oddly enough, we all had the same, Alfred and I and the boys, we have the same blood type. We didn't know it at this time, you know. She said, the doctor said, I take it anyway. I couldn't see my baby. They took me up to the room, took my blood, and they said, you have to leave. And I went down the stairs, the stairs and the nurse came with my baby. And she was so good. And um, she said, here, have him. I've given her. So I had a little while from And uh, he survived. And then, um, I still worked in the kitchen there, you know, for the soup. And uh, one day uh, we were sitting and I had little Ingo with me and the women were asking me, uh, well, before uh, I had uh, gone, that was before the Russians came. It was still water. Uh, I had to go to the military headquarters to register there so I get Alfred's salary. And there was one officer who asked me if I know where my husband is. And I said, no, I know his number and his rank and everything, but I don't know where he is. I know only at some place in Czechoslovakia. And there was a courier and he said, I said, I had a baby in the meantime and he doesn't even know if I'm alive or what if the baby is alive. And there was a courier and he said, you know, I'm taking mail to Czechoslovakia. And if you write a letter right here, I will see that he gets it. And that was the only letter Alfred got. And he knew then. If, I didn't know at this time that he will get it. But while Alfred was in prison, he was then after the war, he was taken prisoner by the Russians, and he was in a, a Russian prisoner of war. And uh, on August the 23rd, that was my birthday, he wrote a poem to me with pencil on a piece of paper. And uh, he said, I still have it. He said on this poem, it's your birthday today, but I don't know where you are and if you are alive my son Wolfram is alive. He said, uh, 
I pray that you are alive. And I had to offer up something. And I offered up my daily food ration for you today so that God will feed you on this day, you know. And, and then uh, he wrote another poem in, in which he said, I, he gave it to me after he was released from prison, and in which he said, I don't know what happened to you. I just look into the stars and I just pray that you are still alive and you will look up into the stars and that's the only thing we will have in common because they are the same stars we are looking at. You know. And that he gave me this card. He didn't know that he will be released 10 days later then. But here I was sitting in the kitchen and the women said, uh, did you ever hear from your husband? And I said, no, I didn't. And they, and, and they said, that's too bad. <coughs> and I said, you know what, it's so funny. There are days when I don't even think of him. Not at all. And I said, there are days when I think of him constantly. And today is a day where I almost feel him. I feel like he's here, you know. An hour later, my sister Rosemary, who had gone with my mother to the hospital to see Wolfram, comes running in and she said, Uli, come out, come out. And I said, what for? Come out. And she said, take Ingo. And I took Ingo, and uh, the women guessed something, she, they told me afterwards. And I went out, and here was Alfred, released from prison. And see, I knew I was right, he would go first to his sister, okay. And Alfred, Alfred saw, uh, my mother said, here she was walking with Rosemary on the street, and my, Rose, my sister Rosemary ta talks a lot, without interruption. And my mother said, I didn't even want to listen anymore, and I just said, yes, yes, yes. And Rosemary said, in the same tone, she said, there's Alfred. And my mother said, yes, yes. <laughs> because she didn't even listen to her, and my Rosemary said, Mutti, there's Alfred, walking. And she looked over and they met him on the street. And he was still in his uniform, everything was ripped off, you know. And they came back and they got me out from me. And Alfred cried and I cried. And you know what? The Russian soldiers who had chased us every night cried like babies when they saw him, really. And. Uh, the first thing Alfred never said, how is the baby? He saw Ingo. He didn't say, where do you live? We lost everything. How are you doing? He was shaved. All his hair was gone. And he said, they cut my hair. That was the first thing he said. He didn't know. What? Yes. They cut my hair. And I said, Alfred, it doesn't matter. And the, kid, the Russian people then, they were so good to us. And they said, you don't have to work anymore, but you can come each day and pick up a pot of soup. Which we, because Alfred weighed 90 pounds. And then a couple of days later, I was able to pick, bring Wolfram home from the hospital. And he weighed nine pounds. He was six months old. Can you imagine? He looked like a skinned rabbit. Nobody, nobody thought he would be able to survive. And then here we were in a room, one kitchen, one room, smaller than my bedroom here, you know. And uh, so we decided we want to go to a different city. There were so many stories in between. I could tell you time is running out, you know. Mm -hmm. No, that's so all we right. Went we'll take what time we have. 
We went to, uh, I've heard, we, uh, I've heard applied to three cities in the Russian zone for work and if they would have housing for us. And all three said yes, because Alfred was a cabinet maker by trade then, you know. He still had his uniform. uniform. I didn't save any of his civilian clothes, because uh, I was lucky that I had diapers and baby clothes for the children, for little Wolfram. Then we came to Jena, and we got a room uh, with old people who had an apartment. They had to. We were forced to live with them. It was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And, uh, but Jena was not only famous for the size factories, you know, they manufactured lenses mm -hmm. and, uh, for cameras, for the uh, airplanes, whatever. You know, these optical instruments. Mm -hmm. They also had the shut S-C-H-O-T-T industry there where they produced glass you know this, we called it Jena glass, it's this glass you cook with, mm -hmm. came from Jena, and Alfred found a job in the factory there. And uh, Jena also is a very old university city, so I took Wolfram to, uh, to the university clinic, and there was a professor from Turkey, a child, a pediatrician and uh, he told me he said if you want to save your baby you have to feed him like they used to feed babies in the ancient times his stomach has to get lining again and so he said what you do you take wheat flour and you roast it on an on an iron plate on the stove until it's like yellow and then you fill it up with half water and half milk and that's the only way you can save your baby and I did I did Wolfram when he was a year old he still looked like he was six months old and he looked like a little girl so when people always would say, isn't he a cute girl, how old is she, is she, you know, mm -hmm. and I said six months. But he walked when he was one and a half years old in the West End, you know, he made up for it. Then. But I saved him, I saved him. Mm -hmm. And so it, things were better uh, when Wolf, uh, when I was with Alfred. We were still rationed, we had our curfews, we were scared. We lived in this one room, on st slept on straw, and but that was from August till January. And January, Alfred came home one day, went to work one day. He always managed to uh, take out from the factory the wood or plexiglass, pieces of plexiglass, and I used to cook plexiglass make a fire and the stove it was it wasn't a stove it was just a regular you know in Germany the old um, they didn't have central heating they had stoves in every room mm -hmm. uh, made from tiles and in the middle of it was uh, like um, like a little cabinet with a piece of uh, steel in it and underneath was the fire and that's the way you could cook. They didn't cook in normal times but I did because I didn't have any other way to cook it, to cook anything. And uh, in January Alfred went in the morning see there was a rumor going that the Russians are taking out all the machines from the factories to Russia, and uh, but we didn't know they are taking the people, the personnel too. And so one morning in January, Alfred went to work, and he had to pass his boss's house, 
and there was the Russian guard in front of the house and the bus was gone. They had taken the whole family out already. So Alfred came back right away and he said, I am leaving and I would try to get over the border because they are taking, it's true, they are taking the people with them. And so he told me when they asked you, tell them I went to your mother who lived in the Russian zone too. And I have to tell you this, I left out so much. When we used to live in, how we found my father, we mm. found him, my mother found him, one and a half year later, uh, I lived already in Jena. And my mother always said, uh, the first person who will find our father, because he was sick when we lost him, will get a loaf of bread. And that was the most precious thing you could give to anybody, a whole loaf of bread. And uh, while I was in Jena, that was the end of September in 46. And I got so restless one day, and I told Alfred, and I said, Alfred, I, I'm so restless, I have to go and see my mother. I'm taking the two boys, and I'm going back to Wittenberg. And Alfred said, it's okay. I came to Wittenberg by train, came to Wittenberg, knocked on my mother's apartment. My sister opened it and she said, you are here already? And I said, what do you mean? You don't even know that I'm coming. And she said, we sent you a wire. We found father, but he's dying. And I said, I didn't get any wire. Alfred got it while I was gone, mm -hmm. you know? Isn't that strange? So I left Ingo and she said, Rosemary said, uh, uh, Father doesn't believe that, uh, that you are alive. That's why we sent you the wire. And most of all, she, he never believes that you had another baby and the baby is alive. And I said, okay, you keep Ingo. They found him in, in a city named Cottbus, which was east of Berlin. It was like three hours by train. So I got on the train with little Wolfram and went to Cottbus, to the hospital. I came there, the nurse didn't want to let me go in. And I said, my father is dying, she said, yes, and he's dying of TB. You can't, he was taken prisoner, but they evacuated the hospital from Breslau, where he was, to the Czechoslovakia. And uh, they put him in, in, when the war was over, they put him in, in, in a sanatorium, sanatorium with people who had TB. Didn't feed the Germans, so they ate the leftovers. That's the way my father conducted TB. And it, so when I got there and the nurse said, you can go in, and I said, yes, I go in. My father doesn't know my baby survived and I was showing the baby and she said, if I were you, I wouldn't take, take him. And I said, you know, God, God wouldn't be so cruel and punish me. I have to show him the baby. So I went in with my baby. And when my father saw me, he just put his hand, I see his hands were all swollen already, you know. And he put his hand like this said, oh my God, the baby, go out right away, you know. And I said, no, I want to show you the baby. I'm all right, the baby is all right, you know. And then I showed him the baby, and then I left the baby with the nurse. Wolfram was all right. My father died next day. So then I went back to, and then Alfred went left. Okay, then, then, uh, a miserable time started, you know, because then I don't didn't even have anything to make a fire because Alfred was gone. He didn't bring home anything, so we started to go and look around again. I met a woman from the church. Well, you had been burning the the plexiglass. Yeah, we. Oh, I thought you was you cooked in it. No, oh, you burned it. pieces. Oh. There were pieces. Okay. See, and it makes a noise like you are roasting meat. 
this old lady, you know, who was the owner of the apartment, she and her husband, they were angry at me, you know, because they thought we are frying meat high, secretly in the evening. Mm -hmm. Until one day I, I told her, I said, listen, I know she didn't have any firing wood anymore. And I said, would you like some plexi and you can cook with it? And then she said, is that what you are doing? <laughs> you know? And I met a woman who was from Park. And she was such a nice lady. And she spoke fluent Czech, which was very handy with Russian, you know, because we stole every piece of coal from the railroad station, our own German coal. But the Germans stood guard there, you know, and they took it all to Russia. You, Alfred had just left. Then uh, I was left without coal and firewood. You know, coal he didn't bring, but firewood and everything. So I met this lady who spoke Czech. She was from Prague. Her husband was an executive. You could tell she was a lady, classy. You know, she had two children. Her husband was with her too. But we met stealing coals. And a nice lady like this, you know, and I wasn't used to it. There's one thing uh, my mother used to tell me when I w would go stealing, when I still lived with them, you know, in Wittenberg, we all. She always was very upset about me because she always said, you know what, if your husband comes back alive, he will never recognize you, what has become of you. And I said, Mutti, when there are peace times again, I will be a lady again. But now there is no time to be a lady. It's just survival, and I will do anything to save my children and us all so we can survive. We, you live day by day. You know, you always think it, it couldn't get worse. You know, that, that's the lowest you can get. Next day will be better. No, next day it's worse. But you still hope for the next time and the next time. You know, and that's the way you survive. That's the only way, you don't give up. So anyway, when we were there, we used to go to the railroad station and, uh, and one day it was so funny because here I had my little Wolfram in the baby carriage and Ingo was walking and I was trying to get some coal and the lady came up to me and she said, don't you see, your, your son is killing the baby. And I looked around and sure enough, here was little Ingo piling up coals into the baby carriage, covering up little Wolfram with the coal, you know. And then we used to, they had a beautiful park in Jena. There is a river Saale. We always used to live, live on rivers, every big river in Germany, we were there. And I'm a river person. And uh, they had a beautiful park alongside the river. And the park was called Paradise. And so I took the children for a walk there. But Ingo would always pick wood, you know, little twigs and everything, you know, because he knew we need wood to make a fire to cook. So anyway, this one day I'm going with my friend to the railroad station and we are just filling up our bag with coats and all of a sudden somebody said, Stoy. We were caught by the Russian guard. I said, what now? We called under the freight train and he said, out, Dawai. And I said, no, no. We are not coming out, you know. Our call, German call. And he said, out or shoot. And I said, no, 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 no. And he said, yes. So I took, he pointed the rifle at us, you know. And I took the rifle in front. I can't, I can't touch a gun. But I grabbed the rifle 
And I said, please don't shoot, please don't shoot, you know. And they said, we have babies at home. And this young man started crying, you know. And he said, if I, uh, you have to go with us to the state, with me to the station, uh, to the office there. And I said, no, we won't go, we have babies. Please let us go. And he cried and he said, I can't, I have to take you back. If I don't take you back, I, I, I am going on leave tomorrow and they will cancel my leave, he said. And I wasn't home for three years. You know, and I begged him and said, please, please, let us go. And he did let us go, he did. But we still went back, you know, to steal coal and everything like this. And then Alfred, in the meantime, was in the West. And he had gone to Richard, I would like to, to go back for a minute and tell about how Alfred got out of the Russian prison camp. I know his Yes. His uh yeah. barracks okay. was the only one that, that left, you had told me. Not just not the barracks, but the group of people. Okay. Alfred met a brother in a Catholic brother from a m monastery in in the West in West Germany, and this brother uh, took care of the cathedral in Cologne, you know, of the treasures they mm -hmm. had there. I met him years later, but this brother had a, Alfred, there were seven men, Alfred, the brother, and five other men, they were all wounded, and they were in a group, and the brother said, let us start praying a novena. And I know the Holy Ma Mary will do something. Now this is while, before you've seen Alfred after the yeah. war. This is while they're still Russian prisoners. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, while well, they were in prison. Mm -hmm. So they prayed the novena. And on the 1st of September, that was Alfred's birthday, they told them that Stalin had announced that the wounded German soldiers can be released. So Alfred signed his freedom on the 2nd of September. All seven of them signed their freedom. On the 3rd of September, Stalin revoked this decree. He said, no, they have to stay. But this group of seven men were freed. You told me they were the only ones in the entire prison camp that got out. Yeah. The yeah. rest went These back to Russia. They had to, they, in fact, they, Alfred learned later, they had to go, to, they shipped them to the coal mines in Silesia, which by then was given to Poland, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had vowed on the day of their freedom, they will make each year a pilgrimage to the shrine of the Holy Mary. And while we were in Germany, Alfred walked to a shrine each year. And then in America, first he walked. The first year he walked only to the grotto, and that was always his uh, project. To the grotto the at St. Joseph's College. Yeah, and then when the building burned down, he saved the Madonna, which is now in front of the administration building. It has a plaque on it with his name on it. I, Alfred had always flowers there. I do the same thing. I always have flowers there. You know, I take mm -hmm. out flowers, I water them, and everything. I uh, always wanted a grotto. The year before he died, I bought him the Holy Mary, so he can build a grotto in our backyard. He w it, it, Father O'Reilly said this is at the funeral mass, that he never missed, even in September of 87, Alfred could hardly walk, but he drove to the monastery near Valparaiso to the garden there. 
because he kept his wife, his vow, all these years, ever since they were released. And see, then when he was fleeing from the Russian zone, he knew this brother is from the uh, then French. This is when he's leaving from Jena now? Yeah. Okay. It, he knew that he is from, the brother is in the French occupation zone. So he went there to this monastery and they took it in, him in and they were very nice. And Alfred said, wrote to me, I'm trying to get the papers so you can come over. And, but the, uh, what do you call, we call it the Abt in German, the main brother, the, the lady, abbot, the abbot mm -hmm. yeah, he said they want to keep Alfred, he worked there, but no family. Now, I thought that was terrible. They didn't want any part of a family, no way, you know. So, in a way, it was good because then Alfred, uh, the, Alfred said, I have a family, I have to be with my family, so I, I'm not going to stay here. And he had food, he had everything. Mm -hmm. He had a good life, you know, he said, I, no. And so he went to the mayor and told them that he lost his job and he got he told the mayor in the city that he is there illegally in the Which city French, is this now? It's in the French zone. Okay. French occupation zone. Now I forgot the name of the monastery. It's on the Rhine. It's between Bonn and Cologne. Okay. A monastery. Ebersbach. Mm -hmm. Ebersbach. Eber, close to Ebersbach. And <coughs> so uh, uh, this way, uh, the mayor threw him, threw him out from the city, and but he got papers that he was, uh, he could not stay in the French occupation zone because he was there illegally. Now that's all he wanted, papers that he has a right to stay in the West, okay? So he got on the train, and on the train, you know, when you're on the train you talk to people, and he met a man, Adam Wiltz. He was an Hungarian man, and he asked Alfred 